Hello, this is Jeff Gold. Last week we spoke to Randy California and Ed Cassidy of Spirit about their music, their history, and their new album, The Legendary Potato Land on Rhino Records. We hope you find this interview interesting as it chronicles the life and times of one of the rock era's most influential groups. Ed, you started as a jazz drummer, did some R&B. How and when did you decide to make drumming a career, and how did you get into rock drumming? Well, I decided to get into playing drums when I was about 13, and uh, I started out playing country western, and uh, gradually, you know, worked into different kinds of music, uh, everything from uh, polkas to Dixieland to jazz, and gradually, as the years went by, uh, when rock and roll came in, I got into that in about 63. Mm -hmm. I had played with jazz groups and rhythm and blues groups prior to that. In 64 and 65, you're in the Rising Suns with Ry Cooter and Taj Mahal, and it was a seminal folk rock uh, fusion type thing. Uh, mm -hmm. How was that band formed, and how would you describe it? Well, I actually went into the band in 1965, and they were playing at a club, and they had just formed uh, in Los Angeles at a place called the Ashgrove. Mm -hmm and uh, they needed a drummer and a friend of mine was playing bass. So Gary Marker and uh, I went down and uh, tried out with the band and it worked okay. So we started playing together and we played around Los Angeles area for a while and uh, it was a really good band. Very yeah. interesting, very hot. I've heard some of the unreleased tapes and they are great. Uh, yeah. Could you tell us how, how you came to leave? It was something involving an injury with your... Yeah. I tore a ligament in my wrist and uh, because it was I guess it happened because I had to play so hard and I wasn't used to that being a jazz drummer you know mm -hmm. and plus the style of playing for drums instead of playing the traditional way you play rock and roll style on the, you know the drums yeah. and the sock cymbal so your arm is in a different position so the fact that it was and I and it was, you know, I was doing it so hard that I guess I pulled a muscle, uh, ligament and tore it in my wrist, so I had to put it in a cast. Must have been pretty traumatic, uh, right at the point where they started to create a lot of interest. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was difficult. Around about the time you were playing then, you got the name Cash, Cast Strange Drums, too. For Did a short time, out? yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that sort of came about because uh, one, of the, uh, one night we were playing at the Ash Grove, and uh, Bill Wyman of the Stones and somebody else came in the club and uh, we were sitting around talking and uh, he asked what my name was and I said Ed Cassidy and he said well what kind of a name is that you know and uh, you know you ought to have something you know more dramatic or something like that so then <coughs> somebody I forget who decided that uh, I think it was the bass player that ought to be called Cash Strangestrom that didn't last too long though yeah. <laughs> Randy, how did you and Ed uh, meet? <clears throat> it was at the Ash Grove, and it was at a Rising Sun show. And the Ash Grove was owned by my uncle, Edwin Pearl. Oh, really? Yeah, and I was like about 12 years old or something. And my mother brought me down, and we saw the Rising Suns play, and that's how I met Cask at that time. You and Ed were that's related the for a while, right? Uh-huh. I actually married my mom when I was about 13 years old, uh -huh. and they were married for about how many years? Seven years. Seven years. Yeah. How would you feel about having a stepfather in a <coughs> pop band? It was great. Um, when you were really young, I guess you started playing guitar. You had to have been. How early really was it, and how did it come about? I think I was about five years old when I got my first guitar. And my mom, who played guitar, folk music, country music, taught me my first chords. And um, I went on f from there into a lot of country picking. And of course, my uncle owning the Ash Grove, a lot of the artists that came to play at the Ash Grove, such as Doc Watson, Mance Lipscomb, and um, a lot of the blues and country groups, they'd be staying at our house when they came to Los Angeles from various parts of the country. And I'd get free lessons from some of the great mm -hmm. artists great. when I was really young. Who did you really like around then? Who were your big inspirations? I guess like Brownie, McGee, and Sonny Terry. And of course, Matt Slipscomb took a special liking to me and taught me a lot of the old blues songs.
That's great. Around 14, you guys got together in the Red Roosters, which was really basically spirit without John Locke. Uh, how did that get together? Yeah. Uh, well, Randy, I, as I remember, uh, Randy and Jay and Mark and another guitarist named uh, Mike Fondelier, uh were putting together a band uh, at that time. And as I understood it, you know, the drummer that they had wasn't working out or something to that effect. So they needed, and they were going to do a battle of the bands or something like that. And uh, so at that point I was married to his mother and uh, she suggested that why don't you help him out, you know, and get him going, right. you know, in the right direction and all that. So from there, you know, we sort of got together and started rehearsing and doing things. And we played around the Los Angeles area. Randy, at the time, just I guess just after that, you were in New York for a while and played with Jimi Hendrix. How did that all come about, and who was it with? <clears throat> I guess uh, after the Red Roosters broke up, me, Cass, and the family moved out to New York. And one day I was in Manny's Music in the village, I mean in 42nd Street or whatever, and I was looking for an electric guitar to buy or play and there was this guy standing there playing this guitar and I said can I please borrow it and show you some things I know and that was turned out to be Jimi Hendrix he said his name was Jimmy James and he really liked what I was playing I played some slide guitar and some blues and he invited me to come down to a club that night which was a cafe wa in the village and um, this is the first time that he'd ever done a solo trip before then he'd been playing back up to Little mm -hmm. Richard and various other people and he really wanted to have another guitar player and we switched leads and he taught me Hey Joe and Wild Thing and some other songs like Shotgun and we played together for like three or four months five sets a night what kind of music were you guys doing? mostly old blues and uh, rock and roll and a few original songs was it blues project type stuff? Uh, which seems to be about the time that that stuff was happening, maybe a little bit earlier? Um, uh, like the Mike Butterfield Blues Band? Paul Butterfield? Paul Butterfield, yeah. right. Mike Bloomfield, they were playing around yeah. the corner. Okay. Love and Spoonful were playing around the village at that time. But the music was basically, you know, old blues and rock and roll. Must have been a great time. Yeah, yeah it was. It wasn't really a tight band band where everyone has the same goals because uh -huh. I, I was only 14 years old and I, I was just, you know, like playing hooky from school and going <laughs> in there and playing guitar. So I was just having fun, you know, making $7 a night. I didn't care. I was just, you know, grooving. And I guess some people from England saw Jimmy and thought he had a lot of potential. Chas Chandler and uh, some of the Rolling Stones came in and saw him. They thought he was going to be really hot. And they decided they wanted to take him over to England and make him a star. <clears throat> Jimmy wanted to take me with him, but I decided to stick it out with Cass and uh, go our own way. Were you or Hendrix writing original material at that time? Yeah, Jimmy had written maybe two or three original songs. We never really got together and rehearsed too much. But um, one song he used to call Mr. Bad Luck. He always thought somebody was coming after him, somebody to give him bad luck. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the original songs I remember that we did together. So, uh, you guys at some point must have come back here and gotten back together with the Nucleus of Spirit, or Red Roosters. How did that come to happen? Oh, well, I guess there was like a love-in at Griffith Park or something. And I happened to see Jay there. And... I started, I sat down, Jay with a guitar, and I said, listen to this stuff this guy Jimmy James was playing, I was doing in New York, and he got all excited, and we started talking about getting back together again and doing something. I guess that was it. We met at 11 and decided to give it another try. A classic <laughs> Two <story>. years later. <laughs> well, we had, <coughs> Randy and I had uh, uh, put together a band uh, that really didn't have a name, per se, at that point. And uh, it was a combination of, uh, of jazz and blues and what have you. We had a, a, a black kunga player 
and uh, a jazz. Oh, wait, well, John was playing. John Locke was playing piano. Uh, we had Bob Arkin's younger brother, Alan Arkin. I mean, the other way around. Yeah. Right? Alan Arkin's younger brother, Bob, was playing acoustic bass, and uh, so we were playing uh, around in the area. One of the places was at the Beach House when it was still there. Right. Then that we did that for a little while, searching for an ideas and how to get things happening. And then the, uh, the Kunga player got busted, and, uh, and then one thing or another happened. Then gradually we just kept adding people, dropping people, adding people. And uh, at one point uh, we got together with Mark and, uh, uh, and Jay and another bass player who was acoustic. So we had two bass players. One was acoustic and oh, one was electric. And uh, Jay was actually the last one to come into the band. And so then we finally got that happening and decided to call the band Spirits Rebellious from the Gibran book. Mm -hmm. And then we decided that that was a little pretentious. So we decided just to cut off the last part and, and leave it at Spirit. And start playing around town, you know, at all the places. How did you guys uh, meet up with Lou Adler, who was your producer and the owner of Ode Records, your label, and how did you get signed? Well, <coughs> we were playing at the Ash Grove, and uh, we're, we're starting to build a pretty good following there, and people start hearing about us, you know how they will, mm -hmm. especially if you can play in one place long enough. And uh, I guess Lou evidently had heard about us, so he sent down uh, one of his representatives and uh, listened to the band, and he went back and uh, told Lou, as far as the story goes, that the band uh, instrumentally was really hot, but vocally it was, and it was very loose, mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't that way, you know. So then uh, we kept building our rep up a little more, and then finally Lou decided he wanted to hear us, so we auditioned for him down to Whiskey. And, uh, and, you know, in the meantime, we had played around, did our, did our record company auditions, you know, for all the diff different ones mm -hmm. we come up with. And then he decided that he would take us on. The history from then is pretty well chronicled. You guys, uh, Randy, Ed, John Locke, Mark Andes, and Jay Ferguson, as Spirit made four albums. The first one, just Spirit, Family That Plays Together, Clear, and Twelve Dreams of Dr. Sardonicus. Mm -hmm. It seemed then that radio was a lot more open, and although you were very different from most of the groups in the rock mainstream, uh, incorporating a lot of jazz influences, strings, horns, time changes, you still got lots of airplay, especially in the West Coast. And, and Randy, I remember I've seen a couple <coughs> Red Roosters articles where even then you were predicting success, and you seemed to be right on. Yeah. Did you guys always know that you'd make it? Were there times where you thought about throwing it all away? We really never thought about making it in the early days because we dug playing with each other and just creating music and being together so much that we were making it, you know, no matter how big a place we played. And we started doing our tours around the country. we start out like in Dallas and Chicago and Boston or wherever, and there'd be like 20 or 30 people at our shows. The next time we went, there was 200, 300. The next time we went, we were playing 2,000, 3,000 seat places. And finally at our heyday, uh, when God Land and You was a big hit, and between then and Sardonicus, you know, we were playing at least 5,000 seat halls. And so we never really thought about success. It kind of just happened for us. We always really related with the people. <coughs> You were really young at that point. Did uh, do you feel in retrospect that you missed out on some of the things that most kids do? I did uh, because I'd been playing music since you know I was real young. But then after Sardonicus uh, came out, um, the group broke up right after that, and I took some time off and I did some of the normal things that quote-unquote normal people do. Got some straight jobs. I lived over in Hawaii for about three years. I was a dishwasher. I made charcoal. I worked at McDonald's. <laughs> and so I kind of caught up on some of the normal things that normal people do. That's great. Uh, getting back to spirit, uh, Randy, as time went on, you seemed to be increasingly more prominent in the band. The first album you wrote one song and collaborated on one. Second album, you were involved in five songs, including the first hit, I Got a Line on You. 
then Clear had six of your songs, and Dr. Sardonicus had seven. Uh, and in fact, both of Spirit's other hits, 1984 and Nature's Way, were your songs too. Mm -hmm. Did that start to create friction in the band? That you, the youngest member, were really taking on a lot of the uh, limelight? Yeah, I guess so. I guess between me and Jay F Ferguson, who's the other main writer, we had different concepts of what the band should be. Like when we went on the road, I enjoyed just getting out there and maybe playing Hey Joe or something else, like an old song I used to do with Jimi Hendrix, which is part of my you know, mm -hmm. roots and stuff that I like to do. Whereas Jay wanted a more controlled set, set, you know, commercial quote unquote. And I was more into just, you know, kicking out the jams and being more free on stage. So, yeah, there was friction in the group, and that's mm -hmm. one of the main reasons why the group broke up. I guess during the recording of, of Sardonicus, there was a lot of friction and power plays and this and that, and, and luckily we had David Briggs there sort of overseeing everything to kind of pull it together, even though it fell apart in a couple of points. And, yeah, there was jockeying and all that stuff. And I guess at that point, everyone felt that they had their own definite ideas of what they wanted to do. Jay and Mark wanted a strictly rock and roll band, so they got together and formed Jojo Gunn. In the middle of Sardonicus, I had a horse accident. I fell off a horse and cracked my head, and I was in the hospital for a while. And at that point, Jay and Mark got together and formed Jojo Gunn. How did, uh, after the 12 Dreams, you left... Uh Ode for Epic and Lou Adler for David R David Briggs. How did that come about? <coughs> well, actually, Lou Adler left Columbia Distribution and went to an A and M distribution for Ode Records. And part of his deal for being able to leave Columbia was that he took Carol King, who was an unknown at that time, pretty much. She'd never had a hit or anything, and he left Spirit with Epic or Columbia because we were proven. Uh, sales for mm -hmm. those folks, so that looked like a good deal for them. 1984, your big hit was never on an album. How did that ever come about? I guess in between albums we recorded 1984, and we put it out as a single. I think it was right after The Family of Plays together. It wasn't like a follow-up to God Line on You mm -hmm. or something. It was self-produced too, wasn't it? Pretty much, you know, we produced it ourselves. And, um, it started getting a lot of airplay. I started getting airplay on KHJ at the time, which was the biggest AM station in Los Angeles. Then all of a sudden, a, a tip sheet came out from one of the unmentionable people who tell radio what they should or should not play. And in this tip sheet, it said that 1984 has many political overtones or overtures in it, and you should not play this record. So hence, it became a, a pretty, really big FM hit and it was played a lot like in Germany and England, but it never really uh, topped the AM charts because of this political maneuvering that they do. And how did Nature's Way never make its way onto a 45, which I remember out here was a big airplay record as well? Um, they never put it out. They put out Animal Zoo as a single from 12 Days of Dr. Sardonicus, but Nature's Way is like in the top ten songs that have ever been played on FM radio as far as the amount of airplay and it still gets lots of airplay. Finally made it to a single when uh, me and Cass <coughs> recorded over in England a live album and we put it out as a single on our own, a live version of Nature's Way. And on our own we did quite well with it. It got up there on the radio and records charts of they so have a certain list of songs that aren't on albums, and it was right up there with King Tut at that time, mm -hmm. getting a lot of airplay. Seems, Randy, about 71 or 72 when you put out the Captain Copter album that the seeds for the Potato Land album respond, if you'll forgive the pun. Uh, what was the original concept, and how did it come about? I'm glad you asked that question. I just happen to have some notes right here, because, you know, it's been a long time, about 10 years, and... I wrote some things down last night to try and refresh my memory. The Potato Land story really begins on a cold and cloudy winter morning along the beach in Malibu in 1971. I just came in from my daily cold swim in the ocean when I turned on the television 
and there was Julia Child pulling out a tray of baked potatoes from her oven. I guess they were potatoes eating I'm in or something. As I was drawing myself off, she started saying how cute the potatoes were and how they all had interesting faces. Just then, the camera took a close shot of the tray, and the potatoes all looked exactly the same. And then there was a close-up shot of Julia Child's face. There was a close-up shot of her face. And I thought to myself, my God, she looks just like her potatoes. <laughs> I thought ab about how funny it would be if the potatoes stood up, got out of their tray, and started walking around the kitchen saying, We are the potato face people. We are the potato face people. And then Julia Child took all her clothes off, put butter all over her, and started marching around the kitchen following the potatoes, chanting, We are the potato face people. And just then, when my imagination really started to run wild, the TV broke to a Camel's Filter commercial, and I thought, this is not for everybody. <laughs> and then from then on, I was hooked. Mashed potatoes, french fries, hash browns, au gratin baked, and just plain potato chips. I think potatoes are the greatest things I've ever invented. Down to earth, versatile, humble, and yet so very bold. They're delicious and nutritious and scrumptious. Does anybody have a bag of chips? <laughs> no, I forgot to bring mine. Uh, from then on, I just went wild, and then uh, <coughs> I got together with Cass, and we started writing some songs. At that time, we were assigned to CBS as Captain Copter, and we uh, went in the studio, started working on Potato Land, got all the ideas together, got all the marches together, and we made a little demo tape, and we sent it to the big folks in New York, a little pre preview of Potato Land, and you can imagine what they thought. They said, this isn't commercial, this isn't spirit, this is no good. So I thought, well, we don't have any friends for Potato Land. Too bad. So we continued recording the album, and at that time, uh, me, Cass, <coughs> and Larry, our bass player at the time, got a tour over in England. We went, went over to England, and we did about a three-month tour. And at that time, we took some of the tapes with us, and we played the Potato Land album on the BBC. And at that time, I guess a lot of kids made little cassettes of the album, and from that point on, it's been mania over there, kids trying to get us to release the album. There's buttons and campaigns going on, release Potato Land. And uh, from that one broadcast, I guess the tapes have been all around the world. And not until now, the great Rhino release. Is the real Potato Land going to be coming out? Yeah, it really is amazing. I first became aware of it about 73 or so. I uh, started seeing in England these release Potato Land buttons, and you'd read editorials and fanzines and things. Uh, were you guys aware of this all the time, or did somebody kind of knock on your door one day and you said, wow? Once in a while we'd get like a little fan magazine from England, and there'd be little article saying for your Reese Potato Land buttons and 50p to this guy or that guy. And uh, last time we went to England, I guess it was in 1978, we played the Reading Pop Festival. Um, this guy named Keith Irwin had started his own fan club where he was gathering petitions <coughs> of people all around the world signing to get Potato Land released. And he had to be this big stack of letters and petitions, thousands of them with signatures of people to release it. So at that point, I really knew that there was something going on. What does the future hold for Randy California and Ned Cassidy? Well, we've obviously, we've got this Potato Land album happening. We're really hopeful about that. <coughs> but even more than that, we've got a new group together, a new trio, me, Ed Cassidy, and a bass player named Liberty. And uh, we've got a lot of great new songs that we've been working on, and we're starting to play around town. And uh, we're really, you know, confident that this is going to really do something for us. The new songs <coughs> that we're doing have a lot of the best qualities of the old spirit songs, yet they're, some of them are a lot more forceful, and we're just doing more basic rock and roll now, as opposed to ethereal type of stuff. And uh, we're really happy about it. It's a, a high bright it's future. <coughs> it's uh, the music right now is uh, more the '80s kind of sound as far as high energy is concerned, things like that. Uh, I'm not think worried that about spraining your wrist again. 
Uh, no, I've, I've gone past that. So it's just evolving, you know, the band is, and the music is evolving, and, uh, you know, I'm optimistic about, you know, it's, uh, a lot of things have to take place, I think, before any band is successful on a really grand scale. It takes a lot of teamwork of a lot of people. It's not just the music. It's got to be something else. I think my legs have a lot to do with it, too. I mean, because right. every time I take a jog, everyone says I have the greatest looking legs, you know. So recently I've started wearing just shorts on stage, and uh, it drives the girls wild. What can I say? <laughs> and uh, I think my legs are going to be one of the major factors in success in the future. You got any messages for the spuds out there, Randy? Uh, this is for the spuds. Every time you eat a package of potato chips, think about the potatoes that were thrown into the pot of boiling grease and sacrificed their lives for you so you could enjoy that potato chips with your hamburgers or your hot dogs. Don't take them for granted. Be thankful for the potatoes you eat and go out on dates with.